Welcome back. A few years ago, there was a format meme based on that uh, one episode of Arthur the Aardvark. Kids my age will know the one I'm talking about, right? The one where Arthur is working hard on a uh, model plane, and DW is being real handsy with it, so he warns her not to touch it. But then he steps away a moment, and she tosses it out a window, because, you know, it's a plane, right? It's supposed to fly. Or near a younger sister stuff. But when Arthur finds out... he punches her. And then his old elementary school finds out because he keeps mentioning it to everyone he meets, and they react, in turn, by treating him like he flays two cats alive before school every day and wears the entrails around his neck. If you're thinking, hey, hey, hey what a wonderful kind of day. I watched him Arthur as a kid, that doesn't sound right at all, then you are very, very correct. This episode was a bit of a mistake on several counts. First of all, clocking your sister closed fisted because she broke your fucking Tommy Bell X1 or whatever is a highly inappropriate response that is well out of character for Arthur even considering that they're trying to teach a point. But what's worse is that it whiffs so hard on the point it was actually trying to teach because a lot of kids are going to watch Arthur, you know, the protagonist of the show who everyone loves, right? Just not get any validation at all for his perfectly legitimate grievances until the very end, kinda, and instinctively feel sympathy for him, even if they already understand that barefisted brawling is generally a bad way to mediate family disputes. It's a weird episode, and that weirdness goes all the way down to the animation itself. This is how the scene plays out. The whole direction here is designed to make the confrontation hyperdramatic and then immediately deflate that drama when Arthur realizes he's fucked up. There's a storm blowing, there's lots of low angle shots, and there's this famous shot of Arthur's trembling fist. All this is obvious, right? I'm not pointing out anything new. But the point is how you get you know, caught up in the moment, you lose perspective, everything seems deadly serious right up until when it doesn't anymore. It's not a good choice because Arthur just doesn't lose his head like that as a character. But this isn't where it goes off the rails. Here's here's what gets me. This is the way Arthur winds up and punches. We've got Arthur getting all the way up in front of a composition with his fist winding all the way in the back, and then it comes forward into the camera. This, in any other context, in any other anime context, is what we would call an Obari punch. This kind of punch with the guy all the way forward and the fist pulling all the way back and falling straight through was uh, named for a guy named Masami Obari, and you've definitely seen it before. You've seen it in Dragon Ball, you've seen it in One Punch Man, you've seen it in My Hero Academia. The problem is, Arthur's not All Might. He's an eight-year-old, right? Or, I forget how old he is. This is like an eight-year-old, or whatever, who's mad that his sister broke his shit after he repeatedly told her not to touch it. And then, to go with that big punch, look at how DW goes flying way back, like a meter. Oof. The problem here is that we've crossed over from exaggerating the emotions to exaggerating the violence. This is what takes it from an intentional farce to pure shitpost material beyond any possible justification. Now, this is an unusual episode for Arthur, not just because it's bad and misguided, but because of its subject. Arthur portrays some pretty complicated childhood emotions quite well in my opinion, but it very rarely tries to address anything that involves really meaningful physical or emotional violence. Understandably, because that's heavy stuff for a kid's show, and you can't responsibly status quo something like that away in 12 minutes. And when you get it wrong, you end up with, well, this. And at the end of the day, this isn't even a very complicated situation. It may be out of character for Arthur, but it's still within the range of things that are, you know, pretty normal. It's not really going to screw with your mental or emotional development if something like this happens to you. If you want to depict something like bullying and all its dynamics and violence and emotions, you require an absolute deft touch from top to bottom. That's why I'd like to talk about a remarkable piece of animation from a remarkable movie, Koi no Katach, A Silent Voice. <laughs> So 
so I have a feeling the audience will self-select pretty well, but just in case, I'd like to make a quick content warning that this whole video is going to be dissecting a depiction of physically violent bullying, and I know there are probably some of you out there who'd be understandably pretty uncomfortable with that, so just heads up if that's you. Also, as you can see, my videos use lots of clips, so I can't guarantee they'll survive forever. As always, you'll find an archive with all my videos in the video description, including ones blocked due to copyright. So far, as of January 2021, the only one that's been struck is my brief history of Kyoto animation, but I feel people interested in this video may also be interested in that one, so I felt I should highlight it. But on that note, let's get started. Today's scene is early in the movie, and the early scenes are especially important, so it's worth our time to get refreshed on a few points. They show in vivid and visceral detail the bullying of a girl named Shoko Nishimiya. Shoko is mild-mannered, keenly observant, and has severe hearing loss. It's a barrier to communication in the best case. Which this is not. This is a complete disaster which will scar everyone involved and especially her. But while this may be perhaps an unusually bad outcome, what's important to understand, I think, is that Shoko Shoko's problems are very common to young kids with hearing loss, and moreover very particular to them. Many of her classmates find her presence in the fabric of elementary school social life obtrusive because it is genuinely a challenge. This is why Shoko views the whole thing through a very dark lens. Nothing she does ever seems to work out, she's rebuked at every turn, and as far as she can see, it's because of who she is as a person. Which it's not. But that's just how she, that's sort of how she has to see it, right? And that's before the bullying really starts. It's a kid named Shoya Ishida who gets that ball rolling, but in spite of the terrible harm he causes, he's pretty pretty normal. It did not in any way have to be like this. So what's he like? He's very physical, and he's dumb about other people in a way that's normal for kids that age, right? His reaction to Shoko is one of honest surprise and puzzlement. He just does not know what to make of her. Nor is he capable of understanding how she reacts to all the things that happen to her. It's like every time she tries to reach out, it causes his brain to fucking crash. But he sees that his friends, and even in a way his teachers, don't like having to deal with her, and so he starts ramping up the cruelty higher and higher to rave reviews. Right up until the adults finally intervene. He and his friends have destroyed or damaged something like eight hearing aids in just about a month or so, and Shoko's mom is beyond mad, and she finally forces the school to confront the problem, which they do in a painfully ultra-realistic and stupid way by standing Shoya up in front of a class and castigating him. It has a double effect. It makes everyone else feel guilty, but at the same time, it provides them a very convenient object to blame. Uh, suddenly, Shoya becomes persona non grata, and his friend group is ripped asunder. And the worst part of all of this is, is that Shoko understands what's going on better than maybe anyone else. Like I said, she's very observant, she has to be to pick up on nonverbal cues. Now not only does she blame herself for her own bullying, but also for Shoya's. Now, I've been explaining all this like a 28-year-old, but these are kids. They don't have the wisdom to break this situation down to them, it's just this mix of terrible emotions that they're only kind of beginning to understand. I've omitted some very important facets, but this is more or less the state of things when today's scene happens. Shoya just got knocked down in some puddle, and he comes up to his homeroom and sees Shoko scrubbing his desk. She's seen how the others are treating Shoya, and she's making one last attempt to reach out and, to put it bluntly, somehow make up for the fact that she exists. Here's how it plays out. What <laughs> また<笑> Nani? <laughs> 
ってんだよ<笑>なんだよわかんねえよ Well, I don't need to tell you that this is some crazy shit, but what's going on? The scene starts with a nice bit of voice acting, actually. Shoya walks miserable and wet up to the door frame, looks in, notices Shoko cleaning his desk, and he goes, Nani shiten no? Very quietly, very confusedly, and with something that's like half guilt and half concern. It's a complex emotion, but since this is young Shoya, the complex emotions collapse pretty quickly into a confrontational na ore no tsukui nani shiten no? and he puts his hand on her shoulder. Now this is the first really interesting moment. First of all, make sure everybody understands this. When Shoya puts his hand on Shoko's shoulder, she has no idea he was there. Because of course she doesn't. She's fucking hard of hearing, bro. <laughs> but it's a natural mistake. And this is just one of the many moments in this movie where people fuck it up. Uh, as a matter of course, most characters get better about that as they spend more time with her. But here it just highlights the fact that Shoya doesn't know what he's about. And in that moment, we slow down so we can see Shoko's reaction more clearly. Because it's not only that she's startled. Shoya is probably the absolute last person she wanted to suddenly show up. Imagine how awkward this moment would have been even if she did know he was there. And in that brief second, we see her go from being startled to very quickly understanding that this is going to go badly. That Shoya is mad. That in her eyes, she's messed up again. That's what's going on. At first, I thought this was a little over the top, and I'm still not sure I like the camera dolly in. It's too much artifice for an otherwise naturalistic scene, I think, but I get it now. At this point, Shoya fully realizes that she's been wiping off graffiti that his erstwhile friends put on his desk and grabs her hand while stumbling back. Shoko looks up and gives a very painful look. It's absolutely the look of somebody who is sorry to have bothered others by existing. It's a fragile expression, which should tell you, something is indeed about to break. But hold on a minute, because this shot highlights something I find interesting. So what I just described wasn't just the emotion, it was the context as well. But what does this expression show in and of itself? The image bear, what does it show? Ultimately, we are looking at two very simple motions. Shoko looking away at first before looking up at Shoya and turning her wrist slightly inward. Further, her expression goes from a more openly despondent one to a smile of the sort that you really never want to see. It's very evocative, but how much of what I just described is there in the image and how much is the viewer filling in the gaps? A point you hear every now and then when people discuss animation as a medium is that animated acting can't get across the subtlety of a filmed actor. The scope and implications of this idea are many and highly debatable, and now is absolutely not the time to discuss them, but consider this case. Hopefully, if you saw someone give you this expression in real life, you'd realize some bad shit was up, but without context, you will never in a million years really understand what you're looking at. And that's important, because of course, Shoya doesn't have the context we do, and he doesn't know what he's looking at. He's like, Mato sono kao, you know, you're making that face. He's seen that expression before, but even though he's clearly distressed to see it, he doesn't get it. His reaction is just to become more frustrated. Because he feels guilty. He knows he's really fucked up, and I should add, there really are a lot of aspects of this situation we haven't discussed that really underline the point. Uh, and he's beginning to get the depth to which he's fucked up. But Shoko's not getting mad. She's not communicating in a way Shoya understands, she's not showing her emotions in a way he recognizes, but underlying it all, she's just fundamentally not reacting in a way he understands. This isn't her fault, it's just the way it is, but it's disturbing him. So he starts pushing her around to force her to admit that she's mad, or at least to get her to show something that isn't simply being apologetic, but the way that he pushes her around is one of the reasons that the scene is so good. Uh, he does this awkward grip with his right hand going across to her right shoulder, which means that his grip is at this awkward backhanded angle, and he starts sort of leaning into her. He's not bracing with his back foot and pushing, he's leaning forward with his front foot. It's almost a crouching motion. This is all to say, 
His posture is really weak. It's almost the total opposite of everything you'd normally do in a fight scene. There are no strong lines of power and motion. In the Obari punch, the point is to put the fist at the center of a composition and everything flows into it. There's all kinds of different approaches you can take to a fight scene that involves brawling, but they almost all revolve around emphasizing mass, acceleration, inertia, and all the sorts of things that would be absolutely 100% wrong for this particular scene. What this animation is emphasizing is that Shoya isn't trying to knock her back, he's just being frustrated in her general direction. But then something happens that's pretty significant, maybe it's the turning point of the scene and therefore Shoko's arc in the first part of the movie. Uh, what happens is Shoko bites Shoya, and right here is when the difference is unveiled, I think, between where these two kids are at. It's not the most dramatic thing Shokul does in this scene, but what happens next isn't really surprising in its context. But what follows from that moment is a fight, or what passes for a fight when you're like 11. It's a struggle of storm and fury and not much actually happening. You've got one kid trying to shove the other around and they're flailing around doing it. As a result, this is an immensely complex cut depicting something which is ultimately quite simple. The play-by-play -play is simply that Shoya bends awkwardly over the desk trying to pin Shoko and he loses his balance and falls. But if I were to actually detail out what's going on here, which I, I want to do, but if I were to actually give in to that inclination and try it, I'd very quickly lose track of that big picture. There's just so much. I recommend picking a limb or a quarter of the action and using frame increment and decrement to follow the action. On YouTube, those are the comma and period keys. Repeat that for each quarter and realize that for all their individual complexity, all of these different things constitute a single dynamic system. And yet, for all the cool detail, this is highly visceral animation, up there with Mitsuo Iso's fight between Asuka and the mass production Evangelions. The fact that this animation can be visceral while also not making it look like these kids are actually trying to kill each other is true artistic professionalism. It's like Mitsuo Iso's work as well because there are no key poses. I happen to know this for a fact, but you can tell just by looking too. This isn't passing through a series of poses, it's just constant movement. This is absolutely the most technical part of the animation, and I feel bad that I'm just going to be sort of passing it over uh, in an instant without going too much in depth into it, but I kind of I kind of have to. It's kind of too much, actually. But when Shoya is knocked down, Shoko gets on top of him and starts shaking him by his shoulders, and it takes him by surprise. She's screaming, Gambateru! Gambateru! You know, she's trying. She's doing the best she can. Shoya can't make out her words, but her actions, however, speak very clearly, as does what I would like to draw attention to, her posture. So, Shoko isn't a tiger, she doesn't pounce on him, right? She does this kind of awkward step over, but she does get on top of him, which is a much more powerful position to shake someone around than the weird cross-handed lean thing Shoya was doing. This is emphasized by the camera, it's much more dramatic. It makes the shaking a much more dynamic in and out of the camera motion that draws the eyeline naturally from her hands in the lower left-hand corner in the foreground of a composition all the way up her arms to to her face in the background. And then next, look at the way she pushes Shoya's head back down here. That line of force goes all the way from the base of her spine through her arm. That is much more powerful. She's putting her full back into this. Even though the animation is notably not having Shoya ragdoll around, he's not in physical danger, right? This isn't an Arthur situation with bodies flying back. This is still clearly a step beyond what was happening before. But for all that, there's still this gap in communication. There's a gap in communication. Shoya understands now. Obviously, he, he can't possibly help but understand that Shoko is very frustrated, but he still just does not grasp what he's looking at. This gap here is between things which are being communicated with blunt clarity and the finer but very crucial and important points which are just lost because they aren't being said, or if they are being said, they're not being heard or understood, or they're things which these 11-year-olds just wouldn't think to say because, well, they're 11-year-olds. 
The consequences of this gap and their attempt to close it are at the heart of this movie. That's why it's so incredibly important that the animation in this scene is right. It has to communicate all of these things. I've called Naoko Yamada a realist filmmaker before, and part of the point of her work is to reveal the important complexities in mundane occurrences which nonetheless can shape a person to their core. Scenes which, if shown in any other way, would seem like melodrama. This scene, its direction and animation, are part of that mission. The scene is a model of the movie, a proof in miniature of why Koi no Katachi, a silent voice, is so, so amazingly good. Now is the time of a show when I normally ask, who do we got to thank? With KyoAni, it's hard to know sometimes. They're not on social media, so you can't ask and they don't tell, even on their blog. Most of the time, you just kind of have to guess. Not this time. This one is for sure the work of Minoru Ota. And because I don't want to keep people darkly wondering or anything, yes, he is alive. He's actually attached to Animation Do in Osaka, so he probably wasn't anywhere near the main studio that day. But this guy has a hand in a lot of different things. He's done some prop design, he's done some character design and illustrations for K.A.E.'s Magunko, which is Kyoani's light novel imprint. Uh, watch watch my now blocked uh, History of Kyoto Animation for more details about that. Um, and intriguingly, he's starting to gain experience as a director. The good judgment you see on display in this cut is the same kind of good judgment that a director needs, so he's fitting in quite well. In fact, he apparently gave some pretty good input to Haruka Fujita on the climax of Violet Evergarden's side story. As much as I anticipate looking forward to talking about him perhaps one day as a director, today we're talking about him as an animator, and the reason we know for sure he animated this cut is because Naoko Yamada, Futoshi Nishia, and Tatsuya Sato specifically call it out for being crazy nuts in an interview. They go on for a while, actually, about the sheer discipline you need for animation like this. As I pointed out, the actual fight never stops moving, and it's an incredible number of drawings, but there are also no key poses to reference. It would be very, very easy to lose track of what you're doing and get the timing wrong, or go off model, or mess up in any number of ways because you're lost in the sheer number of drawings without a key that you can point to and say, okay, I need to get to this pose, and this is how many drawings I need to get there, and this is how they should be spaced. Furthermore, that these three people in particular are so impressed should tell you something about the level of technical skill involved here. Luckily for us, though, that's not all they talk about. Tatsuya Sato was working with Ota-san, and he had some of the inside details. Apparently, there's a rugby pitch where local kids play near Ota-san's house, and he used some of the scraps that they got in as reference. I'm guessing he didn't stand around and film a bunch of kids, so that would not be the creepiest thing that animators have done in the uh, pursuit of getting good reference material for animation. So this scene probably doesn't use them as a direct reference, but it did evidence let him get a very good feel for how kids fight, as, well, evident. But that's all I have to say about this cut. Now, however, it's time for me to apologize. In case you didn't notice, this video is about two months late, and it's not even about the subject I said it'd be about, which makes me two for two, by the way. I know a few of you subscribed specifically because of the aviation and military stuff, so aside from the cameo from Arthur's Bell X1, you might be disappointed. I chose this topic because I thought it'd be a quick and easy break, and I really have no idea how I possibly could have thought that anything about Koyo no Katachi would be either quick or easy. And then a whole laundry list of things that were just slightly more important and time sensitive happened, but I'm not gonna sit here and make excuses. No, ultimately this is all my fault. Nor will I make any promises, since evidently I'm bad at keeping them, but I do absolutely absolutely still plan to return to the topic of military aviation in general, and probably to Sigrifa in particular, and I do expect that the next video will be, if not on time, then at least sooner. I've got some ideas on how to achieve a more steady tempo if all else fails, but we'll see. Anyway, that's it for now. Stay safe out there.